Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking very much uh, a few key people. Um, the New World Summit for bringing us to Brajava to hear about your uh, revolution, to find out about what's happening in the country, to be inspired and to take that back to our countries. So I'd like to thank Jonas and Renee for organising that. I would also um, like to take the time to thank uh, Amina Oss um, for giving us a, a tour around some of the institutions of, of, uh, of your organisation, the autonomous organisation, for taking us to the courts of justice. And I'd like to thank Berfan uh, for her translation uh, whilst we have been there. It's been a very inspiring, period, uh, an inspiring journey for us. And what I'd like to say is thank you very much to the people here in Rojava for your hospitality, for your generosity, and for your openness. Last year, I went to the New World Summit in Brussels. It was the first time I went, and it was just two days after the Scottish referendum on independence. I was heartbroken and despondent. And, but whilst I was in Brussels, two things happened to change my perspective and to provide momentum for what has been achieved in Scotland since the referendum this last year. The first was the response of the Scottish people to a defeat in the referendum. During the period that I was in Brussels, over 5,000 people joined the SNP by the start of this year, the SM, uh, SNP conference, which started yesterday, the SNP membership had risen from 25,000 before the referendum to 118,000. This burgeoning membership has reinvigorated the party and has continued an unprecedented level of uh, a legacy of the democracy which the referendum inspired. It's called the Scottish electorate, one of the most politically educated and astute uh, in the world is not to pay it too high a compliment. Where apathy continues is a political trend across most of Western Europe. In Scotland, the referendum unleashed an explosion of colour, creativity, and most importantly, a reconnection to politics, which had been lost over two generations. Uh, the second thing that inspired me was listening to Dilar Dirik speak about the Kurdish women's movement. It was an inspiring speech which spoke of optimism, feminism, but also of struggle. What it also was, was a demonstration of an international growth and reinvigoration and detoxification of feminism. Young women especially reclaiming a movement which the patriarchy had regressively but proactively undermined from its first conception. During Scotland's uh, referendum, I was a founding member of the organisation Women for Independence, which was formed alongside other organisations to make sure that the majority of the population, so often underrepresented, was heard loud and clear. What was immediately apparent was that the voices of women were missing from the debate, missing from political commentaria online and in print, and that women were less confident of voting yes in the poll. Uh, more so at any time in Scottish political history, it was imperative that women's voices were present on radio, television, in public meetings and debates, articulating our ideas and ambitions on both sides of the campaign. To have independence was the opportunity to shape a constitution and build a country which co coalesced al alongside the principles of fairness, equality and social justice. What a unique opportunity to reframe an ancient country with a modern, outward-looking, inclusive and progressive democracy. To build a country which rejected the paradigm and restructured with gender equality as a founding principle. That mobilisation uh, of women and the crossover between the SNP and some members of Women for Independence means that there are now uh, more Women for Independence members of Parliament in the UK Parliament than there are Liberal Democrats who prior to this May had been the third largest party in Parliament. The legacy of the engagement in the post-referendum surge in the membership of the organisation Women for Independence culminated in a conference in Perth in October in 2014 which was attended by over a thousand women. It was an opportunity to reframe the debate post-referendum towards working within the current constitutional framework to build on the campaign for gender equality. 
and the number of groups of women for independence in Scotland now tops 80. The legacy of, uh, it's, sorry, it's indisputable that women for independence has had a profound impact on the priorities of the Scottish National Party. The focus in the last year has been the improvement of social policy using our networks to address, for example, the Scottish <coughs> Government's approach to women uh, in the justice system. Where they wish to build a new super prison, we led the way in depositing smaller local facilities to keep women in their communities, to protect family structures and to recognise that women frequently serve smaller custodial sentences for non-violent offences. We continue to work with a receptive Scottish Government on this and other issues. But the legacy of strong female voices in our politics has also continued, not least with the leaders of Scotland's three main political parties and the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament being women. Uh, Scotland now has its first female First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, whose immense popularity is in part thanks to an impressive performance she gave during the referendum campaign. And the female leaders of the Scottish Conservatives and Labour Party also gained a lot of media exposure during that campaign. And they have arguably secured their roles thanks to the visibility they had at this crucial time in Scottish politics. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon, the new First Minister of Scotland, is a, an avowed feminist and has, in the last year, implemented new government policies on the appointment of 40% of women to public bodies and has implemented within the SNP mechanisms to increase the women's selection and election to next year's Scottish Parliament elections. And here's a key lesson for all of us who believe in women's equality. In order to ensure that we have a representative democracy which engages and includes women, and in order to inspire the kind of inclusive grassroots uh, social activism that groups like Women for Independence have shown, we must create space within our public uh, debate for women's voices. In this regard, I believe that Scotland is a success story and to some extent shows what can be achieved. But for this uh, enthusiasm to be sustained and in order to inspire the public to engage in our politics, it's vital that democracy is inclusive and participative. We cannot allow politics to become the preserve of the few, a narrow group of people who have the resources to get involved in a set of particular interests to promote. What history has taught women is that power is not freely given. If it was, we wouldn't be compelled to have this conversation in 2015, and women wouldn't continue to have the working collective to take and demand what is rightly ours. At over 50% of society, the power divested in women across the world varies greatly. From my own national government in the United Kingdom, at a paltry 27%, to Sweden with almost 50-50. That said, where power is dispersed in the UK downward to local government and regional power making bodies, that growth at the national level is being diluted. However, whilst positive affirmation and quotas are a step in the right direction, they cannot be used as a sticking plaster which papers the cracks and covers structural inequality that exists even in societies which preach democracy in statute, but where inequality is practiced by design or ignorance. To challenge institutional sexism is not just to challenge the determined retention of power of those who wield power, but to educate those who choose not to see. For too many, equality is accepted prima facie. But for women, it isn't just about challenging hegemony and inequality in statute, but in challenging the attitudes of privilege. Men and women for whom the system works and who don't see the inequality because they choose not to look. Our challenge is to open their eyes and to educate them. And where they can see but do not act, we must organise and agitate. It's when women work in concert with each other that our power is strongest. Patriarchal society imposes competition which pits, pits women against other women. It may take one strong woman to crack a glass ceiling, but I want to raise the roof, and that means working women as a collective. In many ways, uh, your motto in Rojava, uh, the women's liberation is the liberation of society, is synonymous with the ideology of women for independence. Women are the backbones of societies, without whom a society cannot stand. And only by ensuring the independence and emancipation of women can a country truly be independent and democratic. 
If a state is to call itself independent, it must form only the alliances it chooses and reject the implementation of the patriarchy as a structural norm. There's simply no point rejecting the state only to replicate the same structures in a new democracy. Improving the representation and participation of women in politics is one of the greatest challenges facing Scotland and political movements across the world. Engaging and mobilising women of all levels of our democracy is vital for enhancing the, the, the quality of public debate and improving the representation of our governments. And by ensuring greater gender equality amongst our decision makers, we can derive positive benefits for our economy and our society. In countries where there is greater gender balance, there is a proven record of improved social cohesion and progressive policies. The project here in Rojava and its aim to increase gender equality is unique to the region, but can be both a lesson for others and learn from the experience of countries where greater gender equality continues to deliver for the whole of society. Yet it's a process and a learning curve Genealogy is a radical new ideology and there will be missteps. But the progress in the last three years in particular is testament to the determination and cannot be underestimated. And we must be very careful of applying Western value judgment to the process and recognise the cultural sensitivities. But that said, we cannot be uncritical friends or fail to offer advice where our experiences elsewhere can assist and inform. In particular, the right of women to complete ownership of their bodies is an area ha that has locus here. What we can't forget is the role of men in, uh, in the process. And whilst contentious, I believe that men have a role in feminism. However, it's imperative to remember that equality comes from the struggle of people, not the gift of others. I'm tired of asking men for permission it's time that women stop putting men on pedestals when men allow women to share power. It's women's struggles that have taken power into our communities and we must respect ourselves and not think that it's in men's power to divest that to women. The, the advancement of a more humane, compassionate and ecologic, uh, uh, ecological future lies firmly in the hands of gender equality. And I look forward to working with women across the world here in Rahava and learning the lessons from each other. Thank you.